Now, Rainbow Hospice is the hospice in Jefferson County. They serve all of Jefferson County. We actually started as a volunteer organization. Um, in 1988, we began with five volunteers. 1990, we had our first patient. Now, for the entire year of 1995, we had 40 patients. Um, today, we average around 100, patient, 100, 100 to 110 patients a day in all of Jefferson County. Um, and a lot of that is because people know our reputation, they feel comfortable with us, and they feel comfortable bringing their family members to us. To, um, and then, so we go into people's homes and to provide cares. And then home can be defined in many different ways. It can be a private home where you grew up, it could be a nursing home, it could be assisted living. It could be a trailer, it could be an apartment, wherever. Wherever it is that they feel safe um, and want to remain for that, their end of life. So our mission really comes down to providing comfort, care, and meaning at the end of life. And in hospice, one of the um, one of the main tenements, one of the things that we really hold strongly to is we treat the family and the patient as one unit of care. So it's all about total care, um, physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological, whatever we can do at hospice to make that transition easier for the patient and for the family. Because we find that if the patient is comfortable, the family is much more comfortable. And that we view pain in many different ways. It's not just the physical pain. It's the emotional, the psychological, and everything else that goes with it. Um, so, at Rainbow, anybody over the age of 18 can volunteer on their own. 16, year old, 16 to 17 year olds, we do require they have supervision of some kind, and really we only have them come in for like large group event type situations. Um, we always have volunteers come out with our, come out and help with our landscaping in the spring. Um, and in the summer and throughout, we have a beautiful garden that we put together every year for the patients, vegetables and everything. So that's where some of our younger volunteers would come. Um, we keep, and we do it that way because hospice is such a difficult place to volunteer for some people. We really want to make sure that everybody that comes through gets the best out of it. We're not, you know, causing them harm in return. Um, so anybody can volunteer. Um, we do require a background check if there's anybody who's going to be volunteering with direct patient contact. Um, otherwise, if you want to be a quilter, then it's a completely separate application process for that because there is no direct patient contact. If you decide later you want to be a com um, comfort care companion, background check. Um, so we have a lot of different opportunities because we rely so strongly on volunteers. Um, in order to remain a Medicaid certified facility, we have to have a 5% match of volunteer hours to um, clinical care hours, which means for every, throughout an entire year, for every hour that goes into a nurse, a CNA, a social worker, office staff going in and taking care of a patient, 5% of that has to come from volunteers. And now the reason that they require that, it's a state and federal guideline, it's nothing that you know anybody can get around, it shows the commitment that our community has to hospice. Rainbow Hospice is one of the, it's one of five of the only nonprofit hospices left in the state of Wisconsin. There are a lot more, there are so many more hospices, but they're privately owned, they are owned by a hospital, other corporations. Rainbow, we're still a nonprofit. We rely solely on um, donations from the community and our fundraisers and the volunteers. Um, so we're always looking for volunteers. We have a position for anybody who loves to cook. We have a beautiful kitchen at our inpatient center in Johnson Creek. Um, so at Johnson Creek, the inpatient center, it's a maximum of eight beds. So it could be one person, there could be one patient, there could be eight patients, but it's always a maximum of eight. So we're always looking for people to help in the kitchen. We're always looking for people to help at the reception desk, um, landscape and lawn care, snow shoveling, companionship, patient care assistance. We only have patient care assistant volunteers at the inpatient center because they have to be supervised by a nurse and a nursing assistant. Um, but they do all the same stuff that a nursing assistant will do. 
Um, we always need looking for help in housekeeping, hair styling, the quilting, other special events, and any other projects that come up throughout the year. But the main reason I came here today to talk to you is because there are two, pro two volunteer opportunities that we're really trying to get up off the ground and promote more. One of them is our legacy project. And we found that um, it's nice, it, it's helpful for families in the grieving process to have a memento of their recently deceased family member. It could be a photo album, it could be a scrapbook, it can be a card that they wrote in. And the purpose of the legacy project is to have the patient become involved with creating that life affirming memento. So we do it in a variety of different ways. One is a formal interview where we start from the day you were born and all the way up to you know the last five, ten years of your life for however long you want to talk. That's more labor intensive, that takes a little bit longer. Um, that's really for patients that they are they have more of that mental acuity and they're still with us. Um, a little bit better. Otherwise, we have memory journals, which is it's very similar to the formal interview, but it's structured in such a way that it's almost like a, like a diary. So you, you can just go ahead and buy the book off Amazon, and we come in and we help fill it out. And our social workers help coordinate that. Other gifts that we have are memory bears, bears that are made out of pieces of clothing from the patient you sew on. We're starting something with memory stars. It's the same thing, so it's just a little star. We do hand photos, um, photographs of the patient's hand that we print a copy off and frame it. And one copy is given, a framed copy is given to the family, and then they receive the digital version so they can go ahead and make many more copies after that. Um, and then other items that family may ask, and if we have volunteers who are able and willing to do that, then they'll go ahead and do it. The second one I came to talk about is our Vets to Vets program, where we match veterans, volunteers, with patients that have identified as being veterans. Um, because there's things that I fully support our, you know, our armed forces. Most of us in our country do. Um, we have great respect for them and everything that they do. But if we haven't served in the armed forces, if we haven't been in that situation, we can't understand what they're going through what our veterans are going through. Um, and they're, they're not going to talk to a civilian, really, about what they've seen, about what they've done, because we wouldn't understand. We can sympathize and empathize, but we have no actual understanding of what it was they saw and had to do to protect their country. And we find that it's really, really important for our veterans, um, our patient veterans, to have that opportunity to discuss that, because it, it's another weight just lifted off of them. Um, and we have opportunities, we structure our volunteer program around what volunteers can bring. We just recently signed on um, a harpist. Never had a harpist before. We have a harpist. She's come in and she's played harp for some of our patients at the inpatient center. We have a pianist that comes in a couple times a week and plays and fills the inpatient center with beautiful music. We have a new volunteer. He does... Um, Tibetan bowl singing. Oh, never, great. never had that before. And when he interviewed, I've heard of it because it was used with my grandfather when he was on hospice. But some of the other staff, they'd never heard of it. And I said, oh, it's great. You know, it's tonal, it's wonderful. And they just thought it was a little wacky in the head. I'm like, no, it's a wonderful thing. So the more we talk about it, I'm like, he should do a demonstration for staff so that the social workers, the nurses, and the CNAs can talk to family about it. We have volunteers that do Reiki. Um, and that goes really, especially with patients that are agitated or having that breakthrough pain and it's too early to give them any kind of pain medication, they get the Reiki and it really calms them down. So, um, but whatever gifts that our volunteers can bring, we always try to find something for them to do so they can use those gifts. Because we want them to feel appreciated and useful. And our staff really, really do appreciate all the volunteers that come in. We had a patient that she was, she was actively dying. It was her last, you know, last four, 24, 48 hours. And she was nonverbal, but she could kind of communicate with some li a little bit of sign language, and all she wanted was someone to hold her hand. Our staff can't do that because it's one CNA for eight patients. So we had volunteers coming in. I mean, for two, three, four hours at a time, they'd come in and they'd sit with this woman. They'd read to her, sing to her, play music. And, 
um, because the family couldn't be there for her. So it was some, an added um, gift for the family to know that their mother and their grandmother was being taken care of. So our application process is for um, direct patient care. We start with an interview. Before you fill up the application, we start with an interview because we want to make sure that you understand hospice. Um, we talk about, you know, have you ever experienced a significant death and how far along, how long ago was that and how did you deal with that? Your, what's your support system? Because hospice can be very draining. And it, on individual, anytime you work with seniors or, people, or anybody who's dying or terminally ill, it can be very draining on you. So we want to make sure that you have all the resources that you need to be able to do this before you begin. Um, in terms of a death, we, we ask for, we recommend about a year after somebody has passed away before you start volunteering. Now, it, um, every situation is different, so it's not a firm one year you can't volunteer until after that, you know, 30, 366 days or whatever. Um, because we want to make sure you're mentally and you're mentally there. After the interview, which includes a tour of the inpatient facility, um, then we give you the application, and you'll fill the application. We, we do require references. We do a reference check, we do a background check, um, and we ask you what your preferred activities are, are. What would you like to do? Where would you like to be? Who, what you know, days of availability and how many hours? Um, and then the training is actually a self-guided training module where we hand you the training manual and you fill it, or you read through it and you do the quizzes. And then after that, we go through it, and if there's anything you have questions about, anything you need more clarification about, then we go through that. It's about it's considered 12 hours of training. It's a lot to go through, but because of hospice and what we're doing, we have to go through all of it. And I know some people would prefer it was a little shorter, but there's a lot of stuff: confidentiality, um, infection control, safety, all kinds of. It's about 50, it's 15 modules. Um, and then we do the final, after everything is gone through, reference checks are good, background check comes back good, we do the orientation, which is about two hours, because you get a more in-depth in, um, tour of the building, and then all the paperwork that we have to fill out. Um, so volunteer requests come through the volunteer office, social workers, nurses, or CNAs contact the volunteer office, and then the volunteer office contacts the volunteers. Patients and family never have contact information for volunteers. We want, we need to, we encourage um, that they maintain a professional relationship instead of a personal relationship because we don't want volunteers to feel that they have to be on call 24-7 for one particular patient and their family. So volunteer requests always come through the office. Um, and if we call you and you can't do it, that's fine. I mean, it's not like we're gonna say, oh, well, then you can't volunteer with us ever again. We understand that your schedules get busy and we try to work around that. So. Um, and we do and we do our best to match your preferred activities to the volunteer request. If you say you never ever ever want to do a vigil or home companion, then we will never ask you to do that. We're never going to put you in a situation where you feel uncomfortable and have to volunteer because you don't have to volunteer with us. There are so many other places you can go. We want you to be happy volunteering with us, so we want you to get something out of it. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that was the only thing I had. Any questions? I know Jefferson County is kind of a, it's a little bit of a hike, but, you know, no stone on her. It's weird to come out. And the facility is right off the interstate, mm -hmm. so, so it's very, very close. Yeah, if you, um, on Highway 26, if you're coming up, um, if you see the the BP and the McDonald's, you turn right there and then turn left right at the McDonald's and go down the street there. Um, you'll come to a stop sign, you turn right, you come up the hill and we're right there on top of that hill. We're right next door to an assisted living, so a couple little buildings. <laughs>